Uh, Dan Lynch, uh, Associate Professor of International Relations here at the School of International Relations at USC and an executive board member at the U.S. China Institute. You know, the reason I uh, decided to title the book China's Futures is because all along from the start, uh, what I wanted to do was uh, understand the Chinese uh, peoples, and then by that I mean elite people in a position to either reflect the desires for the future, for China's trajectory on the part of the party leadership, or to actually influence uh, those policies that would lead to the trajectory and, and thence to the future. So, but I assume going in that uh, there would not be a, a single state of consciousness in each of the five areas I look at, which are the economy, future of the domestic uh, political system, uh, the uh, internet public culture, and two chapters on international relations, sort of soft power on one and more strategy on the other. I, I got the feeling from reading what other people had written on China's future before, where they used the singular term future, that they assumed only one possible trajectory, and they actually, ironically, tended not to talk to or read that many Chinese people. And that struck me as likely to lead, it's very hard to predict the future anyway, as everyone knows. In fact, it's impossible. It's impossible to predict the future because it hasn't happened yet. But you can uh, sort of think of the future as like history. You don't know everything that went on then, but you can learn enough, you can get some hints as to what might happen. But I wanted to know, but whether we get, whether in the book, uh, the emerging uh, picture of what the future might be is, turns out to be accurate. What we can get from the book, I think, is uh, the full range of views for each of these issue areas, as well as uh, for all of them combined, for what Chinese people of influence uh, think is going to happen and should happen, and the difference between the two, because uh, most, uh, most of them think things are not on the right track, so what policy should be adopted as a result. In the five areas, uh, politics, economics, uh, communication, internet, internet culture in particular, and international relations, uh, the, interestingly enough, well, there's two wide areas. One is for the book as a whole. The other in the individual area is the internet. And there, the views range from extremely optimistic that the internet is paving the way via personal emancipation, giving people access to much more information than ever before, and the ability to initiate information flow uh, on their own part. It's giving rise to the potential for democratization. In fact, some people say it's now impossible to avoid ultimate democratization. Then in the middle, you have a government party sort of line, which is, we'll make the internet work for the party state. We'll find a way to manage it and put it to, to use for us. The, on the very other extreme is something you would very, be very unlikely to see in any other country. You often read in other countries that the internet is a destructive force. There, the specific analogy uh, alluded to, although usually not uh, directly mentioned by name, is the Cultural Revolution. One of the most Hobbesian moments in political history, by which I mean a war of all against all prevailed during that time period especially from 1966 to 69. So people who remember that period, I suppose, think that there's a chance because of all the barbs traded on the internet, all, the, uh, all kinds of phenomena, that the internet, uh, it, it reminds them of the, of the Cultural Revolution. So they'd like to see it entirely suppressed. It's just as new, almost, in the United States as it is in China. It only came to the United States two, three years before China. So really, no one knows exactly what's gonna happen. And there you see the greatest range of views. When I uh, started the book, I wasn't sure you know, which uh, chapter should come first, uh, democracy, politics and possible ability for democracy or what. But very quickly, I decided on the economics uh, chapter. The reason being that economics, the economic growth, is the foundation for China's rise in international relations terms. And here's the thing. The economists are, I'd estimate, 90% pessimistic. And united in their pessimism, they, as a profession, I suppose, is the reason they uh, more or less fully imbibe what is actually called by many of these economists the standard model of economics, which is the model developed in, uh, in the West. And so for that reason, they're highly critical of Chinese economic practices and institutions going back to the, when, my, when my, the search period started in the late 2000s, that's when I started reading about it. So once I learned, once I realized uh, that these economists who know, who are patched into the government publishing and Nebu uh, journals, who know what's going on, they have access to data that outsiders don't, they are this pessimistic. At a time, remember, this is when I was starting this, the outside world was ecstatic about China's so-called successful response to the global financial crisis. They were saying just the opposite. 
And so uh, slowly but surely, as I read more economists, as I read more demographers, uh, even s I, I, although I don't have a book on the, pollu on the pollution problems, some um, environmental specials, I realized that if these economists are right, China's rise will stall if it hasn't already stalled and may end or at least be pushed back for a long time. And that, I think, looking back on this book from a 10 years perspective, that is going to be uh, the major surprise that people discover that, you know, if you read what Chinese people are actually saying themselves, they knew all along that uh, there were real problems with the rise. There are three major concerns of most of the economists. First, just the general state domination of the economy. Let me give you one quick example. The banks uh, funnel 80% of loans to the state sector, which is highly wasteful, highly wasteful. Uh, and they've, uh, as a result, uh, gotten China into the situation where debt to GDP ratio is 286%. It's soared in the last few years because you can't, they can't pay back the loans because they're investing them in an unviable project or they borrow new money to, to roll over the loans. But then the economists are really worried about demography, really worried about it because already the workforce has started to shrink. Uh, there's a gap opening even now between the, Chinese, the size of the Chinese workforce, which is going down, and the American workforce, which is going up, which is increasing because of immigration and a higher, higher birth rate. So they recognize that uh, this affects everything. And then finally, they're worried about, uh, although I don't talk about it uh, that much, pollution and how everything interacts, everything intersects, because you have this older, increasingly old population aging into one of the most polluted environments in human history. Unfortunately, when people become older, they become more prone to illness, and so you can imagine what might happen. So I, start, I did the economics chapters first, and actually it was a surprise to me how pessimistic they were. Honestly, it was a, almost a shock. But it wasn't the, quite the shock that uh, later came when I started doing the research for the international relations chapters, because I naturally assumed that uh, they would understand if they're recommending a more assertive foreign policy like we've seen in the South and East China Seas in the last five, six years, they would be aware and have taken into account the economist concerns, but say, still, it's okay to do it. These are people in the People's Liberation Army and academia think tanks, foreign ministry, all over. They, though, did not, two-thirds, did not seem to be in, at, well, aware at all of the economist's criticism. Even when I would go to interview them, I would say, but uh, what about these economic and demographic problems? Sometimes some of the interviews would say, foreigners will just never understand China. And that was the answer. They, they didn't, and I don't call it a kind of uh, hubris because I think it's more I call it Belle Epoque optimism, referring to the period in France from 1871 roughly to World War I when everyone thought life is beautiful, how can anything ever go bad? In the question of the future of the political system, everybody wants to know whether China will democratize. I, so I knew I could uh, read people who are strong advocates of democracy and probably are in prison or exiled as a result. But I wanted to know uh, the range of views acceptable to the party state which is why, again, I consulted Nebu journals and people who had the uh, permission of the state or were encouraged to publish in those journals. The interesting thing is there is a greater variety of views than you would imagine in those uh, journals, uh, even in state-backed book publish, publish, publications. Even in state-backed book publications, you see Chinese Communist Party writers, not usually identified by name, saying they expect democracy eventually but the conditions aren't ripe yet. Uh, what'll it, it'll take a better quality of person, it'll take uh, et cetera, et cetera, so you can imagine. Uh, but in the other uh, articles, in the uh, Nebu journals and, and, and uh, other journals, people are willing to broach the subject and to predict that democracy will inevitably occur. Let me just uh, briefly mention the first author I discuss in the Future of Politics chapter. Xiao Gongqin, a longtime uh, student of China's possible future trajectories, uh, a neoconservative in the Chinese context, which, by which he means we need to restore order to the corrupt country by strengthening central leadership and then democratize eventually. Now, he, in the early days of his career and writing in this, back in the early 90s, did not emphasize the eventual democratization. Now it's front and center. Now it's front and center is what he's thinking. It looks like that uh, Xiao Gongqin's script is being followed, whether by accident or, or whatever, because I'm sure a lot of other people recognize the need or perceive the need for a stronger central state to deal with the local corruption 
And it seems like Xi Jinping is, is doing that to some degree. How sincere he is, always open to question. But the, the main point here is, we don't really know exactly, uh, how, let's say Xi Jinping responds in all the ways he should to the corruption problems, the other ones, the economic problems, but he's gonna face resistance, he's gonna face, uh, way, he's gonna face people taking his uh, policies and redirecting them down another route. It's a huge, complicated country. So, but my main point is, you can't predict the future. The whole first chapter shows you can't predict the future, and I take on a few people who, in the West, writing about China and other places, overconfidently predict the future. It's just folly because so many things will change between now and then, including people consciously recognizing the bad trends and uh, responding to them. So I don't, I don't know what, except uh, the economists certainly seem to have the weight of evidence on their side. And so far from what I've seen, the uh, economic liberalization sort of kind of promised in November 2013 is only barely taking shape and because undoubtedly special interest groups are rallying to, to try to stop it.